Uh, so one of the big questions I think that I don't know if it's asked a lot, but it should be asked more is um, how to learn to farm. And what I mean is that, you know, I think that people see farmers on YouTube like us or, uh, you know, maybe pick up a farming book and kind of go with that. But I think there are both a lot of different options and a lot of different approaches to learn how to farm. I think you and I both had very different approaches to how we got into farming um, and different options for educational options. So um, maybe you could just kick it off and talk about your how you learn to farm. Yeah, I think I probably have... I would say nowadays probably a more common approach than how you started to farm. I think a lot of people learned how to do things online, and I mostly did. So I was watching a lot of YouTube, pretty much everything get my hands on. I mean, I first start, started getting into farming just because we wanted to raise some chickens and grow some vegetables. I learned about permaculture, and that sort of hooked me into the whole world of market gardening. And then reading books at the time from JM and Curtis, and those were kind of my playbooks getting started. I'm much more of a visual learner, so I really enjoy watching videos. And at the time, it was a lot of, a lot of. I watched a lot of Curtis Stone starting up, just because he was really crushing at the time, like really showing people that you could grow a lot in a small space. And I didn't have a big space, so I was like, "Oh, this seems like a thing that could work for me." And so I was like, "All right, I see all the market gardeners doing 30-inch beds," and I started setting it up that way. But I taught myself. I was very insulated. Like I wasn't talking to other farmers. I was kind of just looking at everyone's ideas and trying to put it together myself and try to think about like what would work and what wouldn't work. And then I just went for it. And that's in retrospect, not a great way to do it <laughs> because I'm a couple years in and I'm like, wait, I don't really, I'm not very good at this. Like I need some help with this. And then you start talking to other farmers. And I think that's been some of the best advice I'd have is like getting to know other people that are doing similar things. And I think that's tricky because in a lot of areas, there aren't a lot of those people doing small scale market gardening and stuff like that. You could be very insulated as well. And that can be a tricky thing for me, uh, for you know someone like that. But that's how I got started. And I really sucked as a farmer like the first year or two. And I feel like I'm finally now in my fourth season and now really on my third farm t technically, uh, finally getting the groove here. But I think that's you got to realize that you can't just imitate what someone else is doing and expect it to work you know, in your context, but you know, what's your story? I mean, you have a much more interesting and complicated journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mine started in 2009. Well, I guess you could say it even started earlier than that. I was visiting winemakers. I worked in wine. So I would visit winemakers in Austria and France. And I really fell in love with the, the winemaking side of things. And I really, for a long time was considering going to Europe, to France specifically. I'd talked to a winemaker about doing a stage there an apprenticeship. And, uh, I realized like at some point, luckily, that I was like, I don't think I really want to make wine. And also, I kind of want to move back home to where I grew up, which was Kentucky, um, closer to my family. And just I love Kentucky. I've always loved it. Uh, it's, I always knew it was home. I always knew I would return here. So I, I was like, well, I think, you know, I have a background in food as well and wine. And I was like, maybe I just want to try farming. Maybe I just want to give it a shot and see what it's like. So I applied for an internship at the time, and it was an unpaid internship. And I have complicated thoughts about unpaid internships, but this one happened to be really amazing. Um, my internship was at Bug Tussle my first year, and um, it was wonderful. I mean, the you know, we weren't paid, but it was a full immersion into everything farming. So market gardening and, uh, you know, uh, CSA style, we did a lot of, we did, I think the first year we did pigs, turkeys, chickens, well, laying hens, uh, cattle, sheep, and maybe goats? No, no goats. We did those later. But so I got an experience with all of that. And it was very amazing. Like I got everything. And then our mentor, uh, my mentor, Eric Smith, he also, you know, made sure to make up for the fact that we were not, um, you know, getting paid by taking us and educating us. He would walk us through the woods and teach us about different medicinals, teach us how to forage, teach us what the different trees were, the different birds. Um, so that's where a lot of my knowledge in that came from is just the amount of time that he took out of his day to like, you know, teach us the various things around the farm. Um, so for me, that was my intro into farming. And of course, at the time, there was not really any YouTube. Uh, there, I mean, YouTube was there, but there was no real YouTube farmers. There was nothing, um, you know, there was Elliot Coleman's book, JM's book had not come out yet. Um, and there was not a lot. I mean, there was growing for market magazine and just a little bit of stuff here, or there, some websites. Uh, 
and then there was a lot of information from like the NRCS and stuff for on bigger farming. Um, but yeah, it was it was like a little bit hard to find. There wasn't the, quite the information that there is today. Um, and in terms of like the internship apprenticeship approach, um, I think that for the most part, people should get paid for their work. And um, I don't feel that way about my internship because he went so far out of his way to make it a really amazing education. But I do think in general, like you're not always going to find that. Um, I'm not judging people who give those, but I do want to say like, if you're looking for an education, it'd be good for you to find a place that wants to pay you, that's successful enough to pay you. Um, and those are, those are good things. And, and, but like it is an option doing an apprenticeship or doing, you know, uh, some sort of, uh, you know, getting a job on a farm is always a good option if that is an option in your area. Um, one of the things that happens with that, though, when you're getting a job on a farm is you often end up at a really large farm, and that may not be what you want. If you can find a job on a place that is the kind of farm you want to start, that maybe has a diversity of things going on, uh, maybe some animals if you're kind of curious about animals, uh, but is also in the location that you want to be. Like I said, I thought about going to France to learn how to make wine, but I ultimately was like, I want to end up in Kentucky. I should be in Kentucky working. And not everybody knows where they want to end up. Um, There is value to, say, going out to California and learning to farm, even if you want to live in Tennessee, um, there's value there certainly, but the markets are different in Tennessee. The, you know, the, uh, climate's different. The humidity is different. The rainfall is different. The pests are different. The diseases are often different. Like, so there's, you know, learning where you want to end up is good if you know where you want to end up. So your experience, you know, you feel very strongly about the like in-person, you know, like hands-on experience as being something that was extremely valuable for your learning, for your you know, progress through into farming. And I think it's totally true. I think the, as much hands-on experience you can get, the better. Uh, having the experience of, you know, having six interns over the course of last year at Raleigh City Farm was incredible for me because I'm I'm a teacher at heart, like I always have been, you know. And that was great to be able to share that experience. And they were unpaid, and it made me very unhappy. Like, they worked so hard. And one of the reasons why I just, you know, don't really want to take on interns, just I, uh, they'd be employees to me. Like, I'm not doing the unpaid internship thing. Like, I, they work so hard. Like, yeah. they do get a lot out of it, but they do work really hard. Uh, so, yeah, I think it can be really valuable. And I, as you said, like, it's probably a little tricky to find, like, the farm that's most similar to what you want to do in terms of location, what they're doing on their farm, and those kinds of things. But I think there's more and more opportunities now than there probably ever were before. Yeah, and I also think you now you get to couple that with the internet thing. So like right. you for me it was that was really the only option. And I gr- and I gained a lot out of it. Things that you don't think about with farming is that farming is a lot of fixing stuff. It's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of physical technique. Um, that is really hard to glean without experience. Um, it's obviously possible, like lots of people do it, and you've done a great job of that. Um, but I think having the two together is invaluable. And there's so many resources online now. So like you have YouTube, obviously, which is a great free resource uh, for a lot of farming information. It doesn't always apply. Not everything on YouTube is going to apply to everybody's context. But some of it can, and you have to kind of learn what your context is and try and learn how to understand that. Um, but there's also, you know, the courses I like that I've seen inside of uh, Lean Farm course, JM's course, Connor's course. Um, so that would be the Market Gardener course, the Never Sink course, just to keep the, you know, not to be too jargony. The, um, <laughs> which we got scolded for last time. So, uh, and, uh, Let's see. What other courses have I seen? Ray Tyler's. Ray Tyler's Lettuce Masterclass. um, And I have to say they're all excellent. They're all really well done. And they are, you know, they can be expensive, especially when you see the original price tag. Um, But I think that, like, if those farms, you see value in what they're doing and you really click with that person because there's lots of free information, you know, all those guys, you can watch their their stuff online. Um, if you really click with those pre- those people, I think that like, and you click with what they're doing, um, those can, there's a lot of value in those. Yeah, people um, ask me all the time, like, well, should I sign up for this course or that course? And I haven't seen in those courses, so I don't know. But I know that they're all great farmers and I've heard from everyone that they're quality like courses. And I think it's really like, what style of farming do you jive with? Like, do you think more like this or do you think more like that or if you can afford it like check out more than one and then hybridize everything i think that's the best approach is like you look out look out there and take in from all different places and then kind of make it your own 
Yeah. Yeah. And finding people in your area to, to mentor under, even if you can, I, it's hard because farmers are busy and we don't often, we aren't able often to accommodate just one person once a week. Sometimes some farmers, you know, more established farmers can do that. Um, but you know, on the farmer's end, it's kind of sometimes can be just hard to manage somebody who comes in and out and doesn't know the systems. Cause then you have to watch and make sure that they don't do something wrong or don't, you know, accidentally weed the carrots when they're supposed to be, you know, uh, out there, whatever, planting something, but the, that happens. And that's part of why it's difficult to have somebody just come in for one day a week. But it, that, that is an option. Like for more established farmers, um, that may be an option that you can go in once or twice a week and give them a day of your time. And then just kind of maybe in exchange, they'll let, you know, they'll let you pick their brain and leave with some vegetables that there's value there. And then you can couple that with your experience and, you know, uh, watching stuff online and, and going, I think another one that is really underrated is, um, any of the events like the any even you know we did a lot of online stuff through through um through covid but anything that's put on that's a farming conference those are so incredibly valuable it's great for networking it's great for meeting local farmers in your area who are doing things that are relevant to your climate to your context um and it's it's just you learn so much at those events and really go to a local one and then maybe try and some of the national ones like Acres or uh, Moses or some of the other bigger ones. Um, but I think finding a good local one and going to that if it's in person this year or if it's online or whatever, um, I think those are there's so much value in those. Yeah, not just from the presentations, but I think a lot of value comes from the conversations in yeah. the, you know, in between presentations or afterwards getting beers or whatever, I think there's a lot of value to that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the networking is a huge part of it. I mean, that's that's one of my main motivators for going those often is that I like to just go and talk to the people that are, right, that are right. there to the to the fellow farmers and meeting the new farmers that are that have moved into the area. Um, yeah, I'll be doing a lot of uh, a lot of those this this fall for book tour stuff. But um, I I look forward to that. I look forward to making those connections with people, but also, you know, you just, sometimes you go to an event and there's just a, you know, there's some uh, course that's on soil health or whatever, and it just blows your mind and it changes everything about what you do. Um, or like the, I met, you know, the first time I saw Jeff Moyer from, uh, the Rodale Institute talking about their no-till systems, I was just, you know, like that is brilliant. I mean, we were not on their scale, but I was like, I get cover crop crimping now like i get that i understand it on an organic level now um that was really valuable for me to like rethink how to use cover crops and those sorts of things so yeah i mean there's uh, and i have probably countless stories like that yeah also you keep in mind that it can be really valuable to make some friends or mentors like informal mentors that you can you know text or call if you got an issue and uh talk shop with and I think no matter how experienced a farmer is, if they're open to chatting, like they're going to want to know what you're doing too, because there's always something you can learn from each other. And I think there's, I know there's plenty of farmers that I check in with. If it's not often, it's, you know, a couple times a year that it's like, Hey, how's it going? Is that that thing work out? Or what's, what have you been having problems with? Especially if you can find them local. I think there's a lot of value in that. Uh, I want to turn this conversation around a little bit now that we're on the education side of it too. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I know one of the big motivators for you with the podcast was, to learn more yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Because you were like, this information isn't out there about no-till market gardening, so I got to go find it. Right. It's funny that we didn't mention podcasts as an option, too, for learning (laughs) of all the things. Podcasts are good, too. Yeah. (laughs) The... um... Yeah. Well, also, think... the podcasting is great because you can listen while you're working. Like, I listen to a lot of podcasts, Mm -hmm. you know, just throw a earbud or two in, and, you know, there's plenty of times you're out doing a repetitive task for multiple hours on end, so that's a great way to just absorb information. I love, yeah, I love, I've always loved podcasts. I love radio. And I think that like, that's a great, yeah, like you said, you can set your body to task and just listen to a story and it's amazing. Um, or yeah, a conversation between two farmers and they're talking about things that are relevant to market farming. And, um, yeah, I mean that, that, but like, yeah, I think what you were going with your sort of comment there was just about, um, how much you can learn while you're educating. And I think, you know, people who are just starting out, should focus on learning as much as they can. Um, but as you get more experience and you have more to share, do start to focus on a little bit of educating because it is so valuable um, to, you know, we've talked about this before in one of the other videos that we did like this. Um, just, you know, you look, you, you, there's there's just so much to learn in teaching. Like, you you know, it's, I, I can't remember the adage this time either. Yeah, you learn but learn by teaching, essentially. Yeah, yeah if you're going to try to... I mean, you learn that pretty quickly if you've ever taught anything, especially in like a formal situation. 
you get you get your butt handed to you pretty quickly the first day you're there and the kids are asking you a question and you don't know the answer and you just like it's awful so you're like you make sure you really really understand it before you teach it and so i think that's a great way to try to understand things at a much deeper level and also i mean even you know when i go visit farms and i'm telling people stories or growers live and when i get to interview people like i always learn a ton those conversations are incredible yeah on and off air like just just really cool. So I think that's been really special, like watching your podcasts over the last three years because of your willingness and, and like wanting to get more information and sharing it with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's so much information out there that hasn't been dug up too. like there are a lot of growers who have no presence online, who have no educational like they're not they're not doing that or they're not, you know, they don't have time to do it. Um, so the podcast does enable us to kind of get to them and hear their stories and hear what they're up to. And they, I, I mean, I'm always amazed and, and just joyous that people will share their, their work and their information. I think that's one thing in this community that is stood out to me is that, you know, people are willing to share and people are willing to share their secrets, essentially what they're doing, how they're success, how they're successful. And, um, I think it makes everybody more successful and that's great. I think, you know, that means that down the line, somebody else is going to be willing to share their success because somebody else made them successful. Um, and I think that that should, that can just keep going indefinitely. There's no wall to that. It doesn't end. Yeah. We're not competing with each other essentially. Like we're, we're competing against the larger food system. We're not competing against each other. So I don't, I'm never like, I'm not going to tell you this thing. Cause you might be, you know, competition with me. Like that's not the way I think about it. Yeah. Competition makes us better too. Uh, I mean, we've talked about this before, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it just may, it does make us better. It makes us better at our job. It makes us better for, it's better for the consumer. Um, yeah. All I mean, right. So, so I want to talk about, uh, when you're learning how to farm, I think that you mentioned this a little bit in that it's very complicated. There's a lot of things you need to learn. So with the interns I had last year, I spent days on irrigation. I spent days on, we talked about plumbing. We talked about like what's the difference between like a threaded and a garden hose fitting. We talked mm -hmm. about how PVC goes together. And I showed them like we did plumbing. We did some carpentry. Like we did a lot of hands on stuff because in reality that is farming. And I think people need to realize that to be a good farmer, you like you need to be able to do so many different things. This is one of the reasons why I love being a farmer because you, you get to do so many different things all the time, which yeah. is great. But another thing I stress all the time is the business side of it. And that gets overlooked all the time. If you can learn how to do better bookkeeping, if you can learn how to market, if you can learn how to run your business and be profitable and learn how to increase sales and all those things that most of the time that people are watching informational videos, podcasts, books about growing, they're focused on the growing. Yeah. And I try so hard <laughs> to teach about the business side of it too. And I think that, that those are just as important, if not yeah. more important. Force yourself to watch those videos. Force yourself to read really, those books. And really think about it and then go back and, and reanalyze your own situation. Like maybe the farm you've been dreaming about isn't actually profitable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that like, especially like marketing, um, that's one that I really appeals to me because I've spent a lot of time in retail. Um, and I love the marketing side. But I know it's not, doesn't come natural to everybody. And it's, it takes a long time to learn how to do it. And then, yeah, you also have the production side and you have the distribution side and you have, yeah, you build, anytime you start a farm, you build a little city. It's this giant, it's a full business all in one. It's production, it's manufacturing, it's distribution, it's sales, it's marketing, it's all of it. And so it's hard to be good at all of those things. So it's good when you can have some help or you team up maybe with somebody else or, you know, it's a, it's a family that can do it. Um, but yeah, doing doing all that on your own is hard. You got to keep it simple and and uh, figure it. Find people who are doing it similarly to you that what you want to do. All right. I just want to say that because every time I make content about that, nobody wants to watch it. And I'm like, this stuff's really important. Yeah, it is. No, I mean, I think you're right. Like, um, I I know other people who have complained about being like, I make these videos or this podcast or whatever it is about you know, trying to help farmers understand the business side of things and they get no hits. Nobody cares. Yeah. And I, I don't know how to convince people to do that, but if you want to be successful as a farmer, those are the ones you need to be paying the most attention. I mean, you still to. have to be able to grow crops, but yeah, like if you need all those things, all of it. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I want to hint, hit, hit on for a second here is sort of my motivation. I talked, we talked a little bit about your motivation behind wanting to be in the education or instructional space on YouTube, just because you were trying to learn more. 
Mm-hmm. And for me, I saw, you know, the resources that were available when I started were not in my context whatsoever. Like there, I didn't couldn't find anybody about anybody growing in the South doing market right. gardening. And so for me, that was one of my reasons why I wanted to put out the content that I did. And so a lot of times I'm like, I don't know the answer to this, but this is, this is what I tried. This worked, this didn't work. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, uh, I think it's important that we do share and if it's in a formal or an informal way that all that stuff is, is really important. Yeah. I mean, the more people that share, the more likely is it is that you're going to find somebody in your context. And I think that's, you know, it's, it would be great if there were more people who are sharing, who are in, you know, semi subtropics like we're in or the subtropics like you're in. And I, I think that we have a lot of, of, you know, information from up North and it's great, but I still think we could use more from up North. I think we could use more from, uh, tropical environments and very arid environments. I think we just need more information out there, um, always, just to help more people and you know get closer to what we all want to do, which is grow food sustainably and feed communities and feed ourselves and our families um, and make a living doing it. You know, be able to do it, be, you know, more than a couple of years. Well said, Jesse. I feel like you wrap these things up really well. Oh, good. All right, so go the learn a bunch end. of stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs>